this one. All right, we are live. Very good. You know, um, I don't really have titles for uh, either me or Tucker here, but I was kind of, I was kind of thinking that Tucker was like would be like a the lieutenant commander on like a frigate, you know, in the navy in the 1700s, the Royal Navy, and I could be like the captain. And we can we can speak uh, okay. we can speak in thus language. So, we can speak yeah, in that, yeah. you know you know that that jargon, but you know it's that's a lot of pressure. So I don't I don't expect too much there. But for now we we're just kind of going through some interesting data about uh you know the culture of Vietnam, the geography. This is our first podcast, um, and in the future we'll probably reform that to it being more of like a lecture with with like slides and that and let and less internet browsing because i know it looks very like kind of whack and unprofessional just to watch someone browsing the internet but this so i'm like fascinated by vietnam lately i i actually i i was always kind of disinterested in vietnam because i always kind of thought it was like a it was like a white guilt fetish like, oh, I love Vietnam because, like, it's this way of, like, the white, the general culture apologizing for the Vietnam War. Like, I just thought, that, like, I don't live – if I lived in Vietnam, I would, like – like, if I had I had to work there, like, I would be totally into it because I would be in Vietnam. But, like, I, I, I'm not interested – I was never interested in, like, going to countries that, like, I didn't want to, like, visit for, like, a, like a cultural reason. And I didn't know enough about Vietnamese culture – to want to visit so with this idea of visiting because of like guilt over a war like it just didn't make sense to me but i've been i've, I've been forced to study it for a course and um it's pleasant because i i've, I've found so many interesting things about vietnam and now i i really like appreciate it and want to visit and it's largely because of the ge geography of it they have these highlands they, they have these mountainous things with like they're like in these crazy mountain passes and uh they kind of guard southeast asia from china historically that's why the chinese didn't re didn't really want to invade all of vietnam and take over thai and they couldn't really take over thailand or india and if they took all of vietnam it would threaten the thailand and india so it wasn't like a smart move to try to do it and it was probably very hard to like sustain but they definitely, yeah. the Chinese definitely like subjugated the Vietnamese uh, in terms of like taxation, and they they kind of they vassalized them to an extent, and then that kind of wore off. But that that was long lived. I mean, it was for like a millennia. It was for a millennia, like a thousand years, where the uh, the Chinese really like just kind of like bossed around the Vietnamese. But they didn't like they didn't run the show entirely. They just they just had dominion over them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's funny, funny because, because uh, Vietnam is, like, one of those countries that, like, foreign powers just can't rule. Kind of like Afghanistan, kind of like, uh, like uh, yeah, the other French places tried. The world, I, I, Switzerland, like, yeah, Switzerland, Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, it's funny. The, those countries are relatively rare because if you look at the New World, there's not a single country that hasn't been t taken over. Like in the Americas, but for whatever reason, you know, the Switzerland is only the only people who took over Switzerland were the Swiss. The only people who took over Vietnam um, seem to be the Vietnamese. Although historically there were, um, there's a, a, a kingdom called the Cham Cham Kingdom, which um, was uh, I believe it was they were there. They, they, the, the, the Cham people still live in Vietnam, and they, they're, like, mostly Islamic now, but I think at the time they were, like, kind of Indian. They were, like, they, like, had, like, and they, uh, they, they conquered the central part of Vietnam, and they conquered, I believe, the Khmer Kingdom in Cambodia as well. But then they got flushed out, and then Vietnam became, like, Vietnam as we know it. So Vietnam was conquered, and, Af and actually... Afghanistan was also conquered at, at, at various moments, but in recent years, in the last hundred, last two hundred years, yeah, those Vietnam and Afghanistan have been pretty hard to invade successfully. 
but you know it's also true about Korea. I mean, oh no, Korea is not true because the the Japanese just took that shit over like really quick. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's not true about Korea. But the um, the thing, uh, but the thing I, uh, but you have to remember that the Gulf of Thailand is called the Gulf of Thailand for a reason and not the Gulf of Vietnam, right? Mm-hmm. It's because it ended, cause the 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 country that really hasn't been conquered legitimately is Thailand. Yeah. Thailand, Thailand has never been colonized, and it's, I think that's a part of the reason why they're so open to tourism, because they don't they don't see Westerners as um they don't have they don't have the trauma of colonization that other countries have, so they're more open to tourism. Whereas other, you know, it's a lot of countries that kind of they ha- they tolerate tourism, but they kind of you know contemptuous of it. I, th- I believe more so. Yeah, I think people are very, very, very nice. nice actually, yeah, very, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. They, they have like they, they, they have like, like a free market, market economy. economy. They, they have, have like they do have a monarchy, monarchy but they're, they're I don't know. I, I, I think in recent years they're a little bit frivolous or something, but they're very rich. Yeah, the only thing is that there's a lot of um, CD practices in Thailand, but that's just, but that's just that's just part of the the tourism overload that's going on there. I mean, it's it's and it's it's not like necessarily in every part. It's just in like certain like target areas. <sighs> but um, but Cambodia isn't like I mean a, a lot of south. There's a lot of like you know prostitution in Southeast Asia and human trafficking. But there's also um, drugs too, and Thailand is actually very good about its drugs, about about you know, uh, you know, st- stomping down on narcotics uh, distribution. Yeah, a little, yeah. a little bit too good, right? They'll, they'll kill people for 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 being drug dealers. Uh, yeah, and the only other country I know of that's done that in recent years in the region is the Philippines, where they have uh, Robert Duterte as their uh, leader. And he went. He did. He did. He, he did this rampage where he just went around and like picked found drug dealers with his police force, and he just executed them for being drug dealers. Yeah, I heard about that. It's pretty, 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 uh, pretty intense. Yeah, and not to mention yeah. like unethical. Yeah, it's but, jury execution, all in one. Yeah, it's a very. Um, I mean, the Southeast Asia is an incredible region, and and like even if you're just talking about mainland Southeast Asia, like we're kind of talking here, but if you're also talking about uh, like Indonesia, Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, you know, Singapore, like that stuff's its own can of worms, and it's uh it's it's a uh, it's it's beautiful beautiful for tour for like education, like. For your own edif- like your own life edification, like becoming a better person and learning about the world, but it's also just good for vacationing. I mean, the weather can't be beat. Like, there's not better weather. <laughs> it, uh, it's it's just tropics. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the, the biggest, biggest things. Vietnam, you'd be surprised the the things that actually come out of Vietnam, the uh, the economic variety that comes out of Vietnam internationally. They're one of the largest uh, exporters of fish. Really? And certain kinds of fish. Um, yeah. That's, 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 um, that's, that's, hard, that's actually hard to believe, Vietnam, but I do believe you. Vietnam, like, a, it's very funny. So, like, you have the Chinese Communist Party, who are, like, really vocal. Yeah. And, like, have this way to change things around. The 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 his communist party is like extremely secretive. You don't really know who the members are basically, and they just enact their economic policies based on what the based on like I don't know they have like a circle. Something like that. But yeah, it's like, um, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conspired. Uh, um, but they have, but they have a market economy for sure now. I mean, it, it could probably be like socialist during. Yeah, the, my the, understanding is their economy. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you go on. But now they have a. a they, in certain sectors of the economy, it might be like taxed, but relatively free. Um, 
a relatively free market. Hmm. You know, yeah, it's, definitely, you know, it's comparatively I, free, and their economy does pretty well considering sort of the limitations of their of their geography and their um and their infrastructure. Like they, they, they have you know very narrow. Uh, it's a very narrow country, and people will say like, oh, it's not that narrow. I, I it's a narrow country. Like it's about as narrow as Chile, and that's that's the narrowest country I can think of. You know, and then we yeah, of course Italy. Italy is famously narrow, but Italy in the north it spreads out, kind of like you're looking at this of the Red River Valley up, up by Hanoi in the north here. Okay, but this is the thing: is that the northern part of Italy has historically been like, it's like not necessarily, it's been like a bread, a bread basket that's been dominated by so many different cultures, you know, German, Austrian, uh, you know, Italian, French, you know, similarly here, like in the northern part of Vietnam, I mean, there's that Chinese imperialist grab over the northern part, which has, has, which is not only a very fertile area for, uh, for, uh, like rice and, uh, you know, production of rice, which is like a, you know, an important grain, but they have tons of tropical products that you wouldn't be able to get um, if you lived in most of China. And also they have, uh, they, they were famous for their lacquerware and like in certain like specialty goods that like, you know, like it, it's a little bit like d debatable whether or not it's relevant, but at the, at the time that they were colonized, the uh, that lacquerware like that was that was like that was a cash cow because it was just really high demand. I mean, people wanted people who could afford lacquerware needed to to have bowls that were um, uh, for food uh, for eating and and for storage that were sealed by a um, by a finish so that the the the, the food could dr so that there was no leakage in the containers and that's where lacquer comes in. Mm. Yeah, even though lacquer is poisonous when it's not dried, it actually helps because it uh, it, it prevents leakage, spillage, you know. And for for whatever reasons, um, one of the one of the best spots for that was uh, northern uh, sorry Vietnam and the Vietnamese area that the Chinese colonized or you know you know enfeebled and enfeebled. Anyway, intro, if you're looking at this map, Tucker, do you are you are you did I share the screen? Where are you? I didn't share the screen. Okay, we, it doesn't matter. I think we're doing good. Um, yeah. If you look, as as, yeah, exactly, exactly. As long as it, there's, there's there's flow and coherence. Um. So if you look at this giant island off the Gulf of Tonkin, it's, it's called Hainan. It's Chinese. It's been Chinese, I think, for for longer than Vietnam has been. You know, like unified, and the, the Chinese island of Hainan is kind of like the Hawaii of China, like it, it, the same way that Okinawa is kind of like the Hawaii of Japan. There a lot. There's an incredible amount of domestic tourism and vacationers in Hainan. It's actually, I think, it, and I, I mean, it sounds cool, but like when you think about it, the Chinese they don't drink as much in their in their culture and their society as much as we do. So their version of like Hawaii is going to be like a bit more sober than our version of Hawaii. So it's not the most party, party, uh, partied up area as you might think, but it's just a very nice area to for uh, for for relaxation. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I've been the so of the of all these cities, I've I've been to almost none of them. Except for Bangkok, Phnom Penh. Actually, I didn't go to Phnom Penh. I went to Siem Reap, which is like west in, in the center of Cambodia. And then and then I went to this uh, the south part of China, which you can see on the map, but it's not labeled. And I went to a Guilin and Guangzhou. I, went to, uh, I was briefly in Guangzhou, but I was in Guilin for uh, a week or two. And uh, that area in the north part of Vietnam and in southern China has some of those incredible like terraces and in like like green green covered hills of uh, like clumps of these clumps like they look they're like sugar loaves or something they they have these like the texture to them is like is like alien to like anything you'd see in uh, you know North America 
Or, but like, <laughs> not, not just that. I mean, you go to the other tropical areas like the Caribbean, you're not going to find like staggering like hillside greenery of that of that um, of that of such fortitude and like magnif not magnificence, but it has a lot. There's a lot of presence to it. Where like, whereas if you go to uh, Hawaii, you go to the Caribbean, they have that there, but it's a little bit more subtle and it's kind of lurking in the background. It doesn't like pop out at you. But in, in this part of Southeast Asia, southern China, northern Vietnam, and probably all of the mountainous part of Vietnam, if you think about it, um, that that kind of area is it pops out, has this like exaggerated and and, and aggressive, um, aggressively beautiful and cool, like uh, you know green hills and clumps and and knolls they're not really hills they're like they're like jag they're like jagged rocks that shoot out but they, they kind of they're covered with like tons and tons of, of greenery so you don't notice that they're how jagged they are or how, how how much that they kind of just shoot out of the earth um and so this city in the center of, of vietnam is called hue if i'm pronouncing it correct which i probably am not and the, ne the, the the one next to it is called Da Nang. Da Nang is kind of like the modern, like third most uh, successful city in Vietnam. And Hue is actually a traditional capital of the of the Nguyen dynasty, which was a which was yeah. a, which was a, I believe was a non Buddhist dynasty of Vietnam that lasted for at least a century or more. And then before then, Vietnam was Buddhist. But largely because of the Chinese occupation or uh, overlordship, I can't really figure out the right term for the situation China had over Vietnam. I know it was similar to um, to Korea. I, I suppose that both Korea and Vietnam were tributary states to China, but they weren't like, you know, complete subservient vassals. So we could call them tributary states. And when Vietnam was a tributary state to China, um, it got it received a lot of Buddhist, um, um, pure land Buddhism uh, messages, and that that took over like eventually, like, inevitably. But later on, somehow uh, Chan Buddhism spread to Vietnam, and that was a uh, from Japan. I mean, we we know it as Zen Buddhism. It had its origins in China, and even further back, it, it had its origins in India, but. Uh, because the monk who created Zen Buddhism was actually from India, similar to the Buddha, but himself. But I, I don't, I don't know anything about how this, how this was transmitted. But Zen Buddhism made its way from Japan to, or at least parts of China where it was popular, to Vietnam. And so the Vietnamese Buddhism has been kind of a mixture of pure lands, Mahayana. Chinese Buddhism and this sort of Chan Buddhism, which is like you can think of it as almost like you know Japanese Zen, although I'm sure it's very different because it might have came its way from come come to Vietnam through China, which means that it's uh it's not necessarily had the same extremism that the that the Japanese had with their Zen Buddhism, uh, but uh. Yeah, I mean, the Buddhism, um, from my understanding, though, the Buddhism in Vietnam is not the most uh, diverse. There's There are elements of Theravada Buddhism, but that's mostly because the minorities who live in Vietnam, they're from places like Thailand, Cambodia, and so they practice what they what, 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 what they would have practiced back at home. You know, they're, it's because they're immigrants. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, there are some Buddhist elements from Laos, Practices from Laos that are like not too different. That are still in the Mahayana uh, big wheel tradition, but they're not nearly as influential. Although they are somewhat influential, they're not nearly as influential as just the pure land Chinese Buddhism and the sort of Chinese bent bended uh, version of Zen Buddhism. Which I I am wondering, like I, I speaking of it now, like what is the difference between Chinese Zen Buddhism and like True Blue, like you know, you know, I, like the iconic Zen Buddhism from Japan? Who knows? Uh, we could look it up, but we're not going to. I'll I'll, I'll keep I'll put it in my 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 uh, my annotations right here. I have like a little document that I do this. Chan Buddhism. 
versus Zen Buddhism? Uh, we, uh, next time, to topic thing. Yeah, we can uh, we can get into Buddhism for a while. You can talk you can talk for a year about Buddhism alone. Uh, and um, Highlands. So yeah, so just to cover the geography real quick, so that you have it these these words in your head, or you know, uh, speaking to the viewer. There's a South China Sea, and then if, once you cross Hainan and Guangdong, you go you get the Gulf of Tonkin, then you go down and you have the coastal. Uh, section of Vietnam, which is ravaged by monsoon, so there's no real uh, agriculture that's sustained there, although it's been tried before. Then you have the highlands, and there there are different versions of the highlands. Different, um, like there's a different uh, there's a different regions with different names essentially. But the Enam highlands are like the kind of the umbrella term for the highlands in Vietnam. And uh, actually, the French, the the the, 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 Vietnamese, the Vietnamese never called them the Highlands, and it, and even the French who occupied Vietnam, they never called it the Highlands either. They called it in French. They called it the Montagnards, which just means little mountain people. Those are the uh, and that that was translated into Highlanders, and then it, we started talking about these mountains as the Highlands. But there's no like they they that, that's like a word that's like totally like uh, from a different culture and like basically like this I mean we all and I don't have to tell you that Vietnam is not you know Scotland so it's kind of funny that they call it this but it, it's it, it, it's it's cute and I, I I don't like have a serious problem or anything yeah and then they uh you know they had Hanoi as a city in the north in the Red River Valley. The Mekong River is divides Laos from Thailand and uh, Vietnam from Cambodia, and there's a lot of uh, really really important agriculture going on in the Me Mekong River Delta. And then the um, but you know that's actually not even in the country of Vietnam, although it has its influence because uh, the Delta goes to the south. And, and, and seeps out into uh, the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Thailand somewhat. And because of that, it's, it ends up being really, really, really relevant to Vietnam. But most of the river, as you can tell, is, has like no interaction with, you know, the, the nation state of Vietnam as such. Now, the cities, we well, talked about these central cities that are historically important and, and still are very commercially relevant, but not, not like, you know, superlatively so. Hanoi is the capital, and Hanoi is also interesting because it's uh, it's a very elegant city, and it's, um, from what I've heard, and it's got um it's got it's, it still has its name, like the, its historical name. Whereas you go down to Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, and it used to be called Saigon, which sounds like a, a really cool name, but because of the of the uh, communist folk hero Ho Chi Minh, they name they renamed their city after him. And honestly, I think it's, I think it, you know, it's a little bit of like a, like a little bit of, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the Chinese name Saigon Saigon, so they don't like it. I don't know. But Saigon sounds like a much nicer name for a city than Ho Chi Minh City. But, you know, it's not my country, so it's not my quarrel, you know. Um, yeah, and then the Gulf of Thailand uh, extends, you don't see it on this map, but it, it wrap, it, you know, it doesn't really interact too much with Vietnam, but it, interrupts with Cambodia quite a bit. And then not only does Thailand extend down south to the southwest edge here, but uh, it also uh, goes all the way down to Malaysia. It kind of converges with Malaysia, and that peninsula that you're seeing next to the Gulf of Thailand, it like just tur turns into Malaysia. And then there's Singapore, which is like a Chinese holdout, essentially. Outpost. Um, and then... South of there, it, it's uh, it's just like turns into Indonesia like instantly. Just you just cross the bay and it's Indonesia for like mile for like a thousand miles. Indonesia is a, a fat country. There's a lot a lot of uh, different islands. There's like thousands and thousands of islands in Indonesia. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, you're saying. No, they just have, they have like a really big population too. Yeah, they have hundreds of millions of people. Most of them are, and most of them are Muslim. It's the most populated Muslim country in the world, and um, it's got uh, like like Vietnam is one of its chief exports now is uh, crude oil. 
So, you know, as much as we're talking about the development of these countries, we have to remember that at the end of the day, what makes or breaks a country in the modern world is like whether or not they have a lot of oil or not. That's kind of it's kind, yeah. of, it's kind of that's kind of the gold of, uh, of the 21st and 20th centuries. Yeah, it has to kind of organize too. Like if you look at Libya, not very organized. It was organized under Gaddafi and like it took a dictatorship, but. Yeah, the people who rebelled, and, now it's and, just and like so Libya has like a, like a fuck ton of oil reserves. Libya, yeah. Yeah, see, I wouldn't have known that because I don't know much about the oil um, trade. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that, you know, a country that fell apart re- in recent years like Libya would not be, you know, <laughs> capitalizing on its oil reserves too well. I'm not surprised. It's not the only country that's made that Well, if you, if, you look at the, if you want to look at the other end of the spectrum, yeah. you really quick, um, you have Venezuela, who overbid their oil, essentially. What they chose to do is they had, uh, they had China give them a loan because over time they... We're going to make the money back um, with oil. And um, it was like something like um, like a couple trillion or a couple hundred billion dollars or something like that to build a lot of infrastructure through Venezuela. And so um, what happened, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but basically like some... More oil was found, or like something happened where like there was a steady rate of of oil, and then some competitor like flooded the market. I think maybe Venezuela may have flooded the market to try and um, perhaps just sell off a lot of oil really quickly, pay off the debt quickly. But I'm not sure what happened. But either way, there. China tried to collect on the oil and it started to like fall in price. So Venezuela's problem is that they owe China so much money, but the only way to pay it back is for them to pay back oil, and that oil is worth like half as much as it was. If that. Okay, so now we're going to switch so they to overestimated Venezuela. the price of their oil. You know. All right, I like to I like this switch, man. We're talking about these V countries, Venezuela and Vietnam. Yeah, Venezuela. I actually I actually sent money recently to someone living in Venezuela just because they they swore to me that they were starving, and I was like, I sent them a little bit of money to help them get through the week. But um, I talked to people yeah, well, from Venezuela definitely. in Spanish, um, and uh, which is actually a great way to practice Spanish. Uh, I find is talking to Venezuelans because they um, they tend to be uh, very interested in what uh, the like the uh, the American experiences. Right? So it's they're very easy, they're very approachable, and not only approachable, they'll approach you a lot of the time. So I, I, I find I mean that's just my experience. You know, it's not like I don't want to I, I don't want to hastily generalize or anything. But that was my experience, and then. Uh, <laughs> So, like, you look at the World Atlas for Venezuela, uh, there it is, which is the same, you know, this is the same thing I was using for Vietnam. It's a very interesting tropical country of a kind of similar, uh, similar, uh, uh, what's it called, um, geographical variety. Like, you have the Andes Mountains, you know, it's not too different. And then you have uh, this coastal area that gets a lot of hurricanes. And then, but the thing is, Venezuela is a thicker country. They have all these waterfalls. They have the Amazon. You know. They, yeah. They, but they also they also call it the fucking highlands. I mean, they they they, they, they call everything the highlands. There's no highlanders. They just call it that. I'm sure the Spanish when they went to Venezuela didn't call it, this the highlands. They called it something different. I don't know. You know, but. The, uh, but anyway, I, I've always wanted to go to Venezuela because it's just like, you know, you know the, the, the cool people and it's got great, um, great nature. It's got the h- tallest water f- waterfall in the world. It's got this, it's got this small town that has like the Guinness Book of World Records 
for like the most ice cream flavors. Like there's a store there that has like the most ice cream flavors variety in like the world, which is like funny. And then they have like they have this they have they also have the longest they have this other Guinness Book of World Record record, which is the longest uh, gondola ride in the world too. And it's in a small town in the western part. I think it's near San Cristobal. And and you know obviously the country's economy is just has been plundered by you know its own its own its own governmental devising and corruption. But uh, you know the. It's really been like misengineered, and it's really it's, it's it's I don't know enough about it, but I, I if I but if anyone called it tragic, I, I wouldn't disagree. You know, what I mean that's I wouldn't be able to, but I don't I don't I don't know enough about it to comment too much in the current politics there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's tortuga, there's Curacao, which is a is is a it's like something you mix into your your you know your your rum. It's a it's a blue Curacao. It's a, how you make it's a great way to make a tiki beverage. There's Aruba, so there's all these fantastic islands too. Like it, it had this is the South Caribbean. There's Trinidad and Tobago, Grenada, like the Barbados. You know, I think that's where uh, I think that's where Rihanna is from. So you know, we have uh, you know a lot of a lot of celebrity value because there's so much good music that comes out of these Caribbean islands. In the, and um, in neighboring Colombia, they have a, a, a style of dance uh, music called cumbia, which is just which is actually really really uh, pleasant to the ears. I don't know much about the economy of it, but um, I don't think they're producing rice as much as they are producing coffee. Although they're pr- similar to Vietnam, you know, they probably produce a bit of both, right? Because Vietnam also produces coffee, so. And then, uh, but I think that one of the differences is that Venezuela has a lot more national parks, and um, Vietnam is the land is most is not as uh it's it's, it's and these these countries are both socialized like it's they're they're very similar in a way, very similar in a way. They both have trouble. They've had historical beef within the United States. They both begin with a V, you know. They both are like in the thick of the tropical. You know, uh, equ- equ- n- nearby equatorial zone. You know, they're all there. They're all there. Yeah, and um, oh, I see. So I remember the Orin- Orinoco is a river, and that's the most important river in Venezuela. Um, it goes through most of the country. The, the, the mountains get pretty elevated. They get up to 16,000 plus feet. Just it's a lot higher than they get in Vietnam. So they, it's a bit more. It's, it's quite a bit more mountainous than Vietnam. Um, the history. I don't know so much of the history, but I do know that when it was colonized by the Spanish, they didn't really run into like a massive civilization like the Mayans or the Aztec cities or even the Inca. You know, Machu Picchu stuff like that. And not only well, Machu Picchu they discovered later on is a lost city, but they also you know Venice. It's true for Venezuela is they didn't find a lost city there, but they were. T- but that doesn't mean there weren't tons of indigenous people in Venezuela. They were tons, and um, not only that, but uh, that region was grouped together with Colombia and I believe Panama for before the Panama Canal, and it was called Gran Colombia, and that was that re- that was a region. Uh, that was like you know that was a, a, a sub yeah, it was a vice royalty of the of the Spanish Empire and the viceroy uh, he ran out of it was all run out of Peru it was, so it was the, I believe it was called the vice royalty of Peru and then this region which includes Venezuela underneath the vice royalty of Peru was called Gran Colombia and it had Colombia to the northwest and Panama and then in Mexico, they had the vice royalty of Mexico, which had you know the Central American area plus Mexico. Uh, eventually, the, there were, after you know all the revolution movements in the late 1700s, like the American Revolution and the French Revolution, you know uh, the South American people who were of mixed race but also of uh, European descent <coughs> and and political heritage, they they chased after their own revolutions and they won them. And the, the hero there for both Venezuela and Colombia was a guy called Simon Bolivar. 
and he eventually uh, he was like the George Washington of, of Colombia and Venezuela, and but but it's a little bit a little bit tragic just because once he got once the revolution was finished, he wasn't able to keep Venezuela and Colombia together as one country, and but uh, uh, either before he died or around the time of his death, the country split up into what we know now as Venezuela and Colombia, but they were there they were the same, you know, country in a manner of speaking for a long time. Hmm. True. Yeah, and it's so interesting. Let's just talk about the modern politics. I mean, I we always think of Colombia as like the cocaine, you know, uh, you know, distribution the hub, like the with uh, Pablo Escobar and the cartels and stuff. But then in recent years, that's kind of been like played down. And their economy has improved. And then Venezuela is like flipped over and Venezuela is like kind of gone down the tank. And it's, it, even though it doesn't have the drug association, its own government is so, it has been so corrupt that it's – that it, it has the bad reputation versus – so it's, it's, the, it's the seesaw has shifted. You know, it's like – it's just I, – I just find that kind of fascinating because uh, you're, you know, how the reputations, they sort of shift and, and then trade around. But that's just obviously just a Western view on it. I'm sure that like if if I was Brazilian, I ha- I might have like a somewhat different understanding of it. Or if I were from Panama, I might have a somewhat different understanding of it. Even if I was still on the outside looking in. Anyway, um, how long have I need to check out the time for this because I do have some obligations, uh, as one does. They are coming up pretty soon. So we've been going for 36 minutes. Okay, that's pretty, pretty good. That's pretty, that's pretty good. I'm going to try to go for 40 here. So let, let's um, go to the Vietnamese language tab. We're going to go back to Vietnamese. And we're going to look at this, this, this. One of my favorite websites called Omniglot. And it just kind of profiles. Uh, it's, an, it's like an online encyclopedia. But it profiles writing systems and languages of, of the world. And, um, see, like, you learn all sorts of things, like, Guangxi province in southern China is, uh, there's a lot of Vietnamese speakers, uh, in, in that, in that province. I didn't mention that, but I very well could have, because it's super relevant to the, the map that we were looking at. And, you know, there are also a lot of Vietnamese speakers in Australia and the United States and France, which is... Kind of funny because those are all countries that went to war with Vietnam, but I guess that's diplomacy at work. So yeah, well, what happened is that those countries went to war and they started to uh, uh, well, purge basically people. So the lucky ones were able to get out and get to America. They were the lucky ones, you know. Yeah, yeah, they were the lucky ones. They called, the, uh, I believe, in Hong Kong. Even before America went to war, and even if America doesn't go to war with anyone directly, they still try and come here. But, you know. Well, I believe that after the unification of Vietnam, and you know, this is after the wars in Vietnam, the Indochina Wars, the Viet- Vietnam War. After all of that drama, there was still like an, an immense. Um, number of expatriates leaving emigrating from vietnam and they were doing so like kind of haphazardly or very haphazardly like they would just go on boats and they would just, just take these tiny tiny dinghies and try to go off on like kind of like banana boats and a lot of people just knew thought of them as like boat people like they didn't they just saw them as these like wandering boat people that were leaving fleeing vietnam so to speak and uh, settling in places like Hong Kong or, you know, or uh, maybe even Thailand. Or, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about, like, the details, but I, that, uh, that was... Basically, that was the at the end of the Vietnam War, there was, there was this, this exodus of anybody, because people had left North Vietnam at the beginning of... Because they split, like, after the French left in the 50s like 54 or something like that. So they left North Vietnam because they had liberal democratic values. And then when the North invades the South, the whole time people are fleeing. But when America finally decides to uh, leave Vietnam because it's like not worth the investment, yeah, people are just like, 
it's like an exodus. Like hundreds of thousands of people are trying to like get on helicopters and boats and just like exactly just swim across the border, do whatever they can to get away from the advancing uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army. Yeah, the uh, the the uh, you're absolutely you're absolutely on on point, and the uh, I believe the French partitioned the Vietnam into three different areas in, in, in during um, the years of fifty four to you know seventy five, and that's just an example of of how like the, you know you have these these invading political uh regimes they just like they turn they, they, they toss up the like the the you know the op the, the infrastructure of the country with their with their meddling and then the country like after after the dust settles like the dust doesn't really settle because all the infrastructure is messed up and all the uh, the administrative structure is messed up so yeah it's like you can only like you, you, even when you even when you think you're helping you end up having creating some kind of some kind of uh, underlying damage so yeah it's just it's just one last thing at the end of the second world war there was actually an uprising in vietnam as the japanese left the Viet Cong at this time realized that they could uh like basically how chi man and his and marxist rebels realized that there would be a power vacuum so almost immediately as like the the Japanese are uh, trying to withdraw and disarm in 45 and 46 the Viet Cong is like launching attacks and so the British like order the Japanese to rearm and re-police the state of Vietnam and, and Cambodia until they can get there because they didn't fight through to Vietnam they fought in like Eastern India and Burma, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the so, so in it short, took a while, and basically, if the yeah. Japanese the Japanese had to hold it down for a number of months until the British could get there, and then eventually the French, the British just left it to the French. And you could there was like an argument that I saw that if the British had more sentiment to quash the communists in '46 before the Chinese got traction in 49 in, um, then uh, it probably there probably wouldn't have been an organized rebellion later on because Ho Chi Minh's army would have been destroyed and discredited probably but they didn't do it because the British didn't have the heart after fighting World War II yeah, it's it's always uh, um, a, an open question what would have happened had the Canadians and the British and even other you know and even the French. I mean, had had the, had all these groups stayed in with the Americans and the Australians, you know, kept kept up the fight for the Vietnam against the Viet Cong and the Northern Vietnamese. But it's 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 a moot it's a moot question because you know like. It, why, 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 why try to take over that country anyway? It's, it's, it's not the most, it's not the most important country to control, I would think, just in terms of political clout. And also, it's, it's, it's pretty immoral to just, in the 20, late 20th century, to try to sustain that kind of effort in any direction. Yeah. Uh, I have some, I have some end notes no, I wouldn't call them Ed notes, but I have some residual notes I took. And I just want to say that uh, I mentioned the tropical goods and the lacquerware, but there's also, Vietnam was uh, known for its production of animal skins, because they, they had a very good variety of uh, animals for domesticated animals, but also hunting animals. And they also had a lot of ivory that they would, you know, distribute too. Now... The Indian centralized kingdom was not called the Cham Kingdom. That's the name of the people. It was called the Champa Kingdom. Champa. Uh, the exodus that you're talking about. That, well, there was also an exodus of, of local league, local Chinese people who lived in Vietnam, um, and that was in '78 and '79. And the Chinese people kind of got kicked out of Vietnam. Not really that long ago, if you think about it. 
Uh, yeah, probably because well, the the thing is, is that the like I said earlier, the Vietnamese Communist Party is much different than that of the Chinese Communist Party. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, more or less, don't even really meddle. I think they really don't even really meddle that much with like small business stuff. You know, they're mostly trying to regulate, they, or really only have the ability to regulate business within Vietnam. But even even at that point, they don't make anything that they do like public. You know. They're more secretive, is what you're saying. You're saying they're just more secretive, is what you're saying. Yes. Much more secretive. And, well, and that's, a, that's a, a crucial difference. A crucial difference. And the other thing is that the, um, the Chinese and the Vietnamese have always had a kind of a different, uh, an unusual relationship. For like, in, in, in the 10th century CE... The Chinese, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they exchanged their, some of their, like, best goods. Uh, sorry, sorry, the, the Vietnamese bought, so we sold, gave the Chinese some of their best luxury goods and precious items in exchange for scrolls that would teach them things about agriculture, literature, administrative skills. So... The Vietnamese at, at certain points were dependent on the Chinese for their high culture and their administrative uh, project, uh, you know, uh, processes. So that that should tell uh -huh. you that should tell you something about um, the, 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 the the stigma against the Chinese that the Vietnamese might have after having been reliant on them for certain things that I think we like certain you know really important you know. Uh, uh, political uh, tools that uh, they wouldn't, they I, they possibly wouldn't have uncovered on their own unless they spent years and years looking for it. The other thing is that um, we can do a time check, but the other thing is that there are different language families in Vietnam. The Austronesian language family is is the language family of. Not Vietnamese, but it's the language family of the Cham people. And uh, that's a language family that kind of pertains more to Malaysia and Indonesia than it does to Thailand, Cambodia, and, and Vietnam. Even though they, the Cham people do live in, in parts of Vietnam. The Vietnamese proper language is part of the uh, group called the Mon Khmer Fam, uh, uh, group, which relates to Khmer of Cambodia, and that's actually just a sub, it's like a subgroup of the Austroasiatic uh, language family, which I believe includes the Thai, which is actually does not include the Thai language family. Surprisingly, the Thai language family is its own family, and the Austroasiatic group is um, completely separated, even though it, it, there's like different countries. It's like more. It's more. It's more like well spread out, and the Thai group is more consolidated. The Thai group it has like a, it has. I guess there's more. There's more Thai languages, so it's its own. I, I suppose it becomes its own family. It seems like it's a little bit biased. You know, the people who came up with this were a little bit biased towards the Thai people by giving them a whole family for, for their languages, whereas the yeah. Vietnamese didn't even get like a family for themselves. Or they didn't even get a group for themselves. Yeah. They should they should probably call the group a genus if they're going to call like the, the group above it a family, so they can keep it in with the whole like taxonomic structure. Because in biology, it's family, and then there's genus. So why are they calling it in linguistics? Why are they calling it family and group? It, like why not just be consistent with throughout the sciences? You know. Uh, I guess the last thing, and we can close out, is that. Uh, um, Republic of Vietnam the Socialist Republic of Vietnam was in the south the Democratic Socialist Republic was in the north this is a pattern that we see where it's the more communist part of the region that's partitioned of the partition region called, it insists that it's democratic and then the, the part that's 
like more de- is like more liberal and, and uh, has a free market economy. That part doesn't it doesn't really insist that it's democratic. So you have the you have the Republic of China, which is Taiwan, the People's Republic of Ta- of China, you know, which is which is the you know which is not not really as democratic as Taiwan. You have the, the, the difference is they just have people, of, you know, the people they try to insinuate the people chose. Yeah, they're they're lying. They're like lying about it. It seems like, it seems like they're lying about it. Um, at least because well, that's like a whole other. It's a whole other can of worms. Of but yeah, trying to get this guy's ideology. You know, Korea is yeah, North Korea is called the, the the Democratic Republic of Korea, and then the South the South Korea is called the Republic of Korea. It's the same scheme, and they're uh, sorry. It's the same uh it's same uh, same axis, right? Where you have the this insinuation of populism, and then this part where they just kind of play, you know, they just go with like a simple name. I don't know. I find that kind of fishy that they that this is like is gone on so is it, 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 that it's repeated so often. Like you'd think that they would learn that I don't know. I guess it's just a way for them to all group together in that in the in the in the China region, the East Asian region. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, exactly what it is. All right. Well, we can close out. Uh, this has been pretty good. It's a good first, a very good first attempt, and even on its own, I think it's decent. So we all we'll, we'll reconvene next week, and we're going to um, have more of a lecture with real slides. And I think we're going to do a little bit more um, planning and research beforehand, just to make everything run more smoothly. Okay, um, t- Tucker, man, thanks for joining, man. And as you, Tucker is Lieutenant Commander Tucker, and I am Captain Patrick, and this is our little uh, history program or show. I, you know, pick pick your own words. Uh, it's only the first episode. We don't have names yet. No, no yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely, brother. We'll see you next week, gang. Okay? See you, man. Take it easy.